We're just going to give you a couple of, of, of examples of where we use data to help, if you like, in the insights kind of around this and maybe talk about how it might, might actually be used. Uh, I want to kind of give a bit of a qualification first. We're not from the pharma market. We're not from directly from the you know, sort of hospital sort of environment and so on. We work in our little area with, with pharmacies. So you know, excuse me if I use some wrong terminology or say something silly or whatever, but uh, based on what Johnny's covered so far, I, I, think, I think we're okay. So uh, our agenda is fairly simple. I'm going to just quickly talk about one example um, where we've used the NHS public data to do a job. Um, is that uh, Asim one that Johnny showed? And then Stephen's going to be, he's the main, he's the main show here today, and I'll introduce him later. Um, he's going to talk about using machine learning with uh, PMR data, which we believe is pretty much a, an untapped resource as far as solving some of these problems in healthcare. PMR data is used, like so like you, you do take sales um, sales out of the, of the drugs to help the drug companies understand what their market shares are, but I haven't seen much done kind of around patients with, with that data, and that's what we're going to talk about. And I'll quickly summarize and uh, we'll have some Q&A. But if you want to ask questions as we go through, you know, feel, feel, feel free. Um, the challenge is for pharma manufacturers, this qualification again, it comes from outside, so I had to go and do some research, so I went to, to Dr. Google and, and kind of had a look around and kind of the, the sense I was getting was that Johnny talked about you know the opportunities for big pharma and for you know the, the payers of healthcare to use this data to drive their business further. It's more kind of getting an imperative that we're in a danger. We're in danger. Big pharma is in danger, and the, the the healthcare funders, if you like, are in danger of being overtaken, if you like, by disruptors. We've seen disruptors in every other marketplace as such. You know, extreme examples are. You know the blockbusters who you know get overtaken by the download. You know the downloading. Like who would have thought? You know when they had hundreds of shops. You know within a very short period of time they'd have no shops at all. I'm not saying big pharma is going to you know disappear that that quickly, but already big pharma is under under threat. Um, big pharma spends about 140 billion a year on researching new drugs. You know the output from that is about 30 or 40 new drugs per annum, and the new drugs that are coming out. There's no big winners like the Lipitor and the Nexiums and the Humiras of the past as such. So how, how is Big Pharma going to survive? Well, today what they're doing is they're absorbing other companies. Some of you come from some of those companies where you know, big, big companies have been absorbed by others. That, and that's to happen. Consolid that's, consolidation happens very often when industries are changing a lot, when they're under a bit of threat. And maybe the most direct threat to Big Pharma is coming from the small, more agile pharma companies that um, maybe are using this technology a little bit more, maybe understanding through their clinical trials what's actually happening through the wearables. Um, they're able to compete with Big Pharma now because they can outsource their R&D, they can outsource their manufacturing. So there is disruption going on here. So really, you know, I think we have to kind of ask ourselves, you know, well, what can we do with this, this, this uh, potential advantage that we sit on? And, and, and more of that in a minute. But for healthcare funders, um, you know, we all know that uh, we've aging populations, you know, the job we've done with medicines are helping people live longer, uh, but that's providing a big uh, cost on the healthcare system. Uh, NHS um, have announced that they're going to be like 22 billion underfunded by 2022, 20, I think it is, or 2020. It's very, very soon. Um, so how, how, are we, how are they going to manage that? Um, and the promise there is maybe, you know, data, big data is going to help us you know, do, do a kind of better job there. So I'm going to touch on some of that, you know, that's where we'll be looking. And, and patients are more savvy. Um, I was on the golf club the other day, and uh, they were playing the consultant, he was talk, talking about one of the GP uh, pals, and he said, like, you know, GPs hate it when the patients come in and they sort of say, look, you know, I was looking this up on the internet, and I think I know what's wrong with me. And so he's, he's a sign on his wall saying, I have more qualifications than Dr. Google. Uh, but that's not going to protect them. Um, you know, patients are taking more accountability for, the, for their own, you know, health care and so on and uh, they expect better outcomes as a result of that. So, so some challenge ahead of us, uh, but we're here really to talk about you know, how we can get more from it. So Big Pharma, you know, would, would we, if we have less you know, new drugs coming out, less big drugs coming out, we think you know, you've, you've got to look at getting more from less. So whether that's um, looking at the adherence side of things, which I know is the holy grail, and, and you do that all the time, um, or it's looking at diagnosing patients earlier, bringing them into your, your treatments earlier, for the, the upside in terms of sales. Both of those upsides obviously also produce better healthcare outcomes. 
for, for patients. From, from the funders, um, understanding um, and potentially diagnosing patients earlier in the cycle so they don't end up in tertiary care is a huge win. Sometimes hard to connect the dots, but that's where data can kind of come into it. Um, so if we could prevent some, one person from going to a hospital and, and one night in a hospital, you know, what's that worth versus making an investment in primary health care? And the patient benefits um, are absolutely un unequivocal. If we can uh, diagnose in illnesses sooner, get them onto treatment sooner, the outcomes are, are going to be way, way better. So that's the promise, if you like, of, of using these, these tools. Um, my example is, is, is around taking the big data that comes from um, NHS. Um, I'm not too familiar what happens in, in other markets. I know what happens in my home market in Ireland. It's pretty pathetic what the equivalent of the NHS pu publishes there. NHS um, are amazing. Uh, the, the open um, data movement has nothing to worry about when it comes to NHS, particularly NHS England. Uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland, a little bit further behind. Uh, but they put, they put everything up there after um, taking out the patient identifiable data as such. And it's kind of interesting. I, I, I'd imagine when they threw it up there, they threw it up there and said, like, you know, we think we know what people are going to do, but we actually don't. It'd be quite interesting to see what actually happens, you know, with this, this data. And there's innovations going on all the time with this, which is what the big data thing is all about. We've actually built a product which helps pharmacy groups understand what's happening in their local area. Things like script direction, you know, whether they're you know, they're doing our services, but they're getting paid for all their services. It's a pure business solution, which I'm sure they, they never thought about. But we, we've taken um, one insight from that, or one aspect of it, and looked at playing around with that. Um, and that's this, this asthma example. So I, 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 go, I go straight into it. Actually, um, I'm going to do something that they say you should never do. Uh, don't, don't work with children, animals, or live, live demos, they say. But I'm going to go into our live system here, because um, Johnny already talked about this, you know, visualizing data, a picture tells a, tells, a hundred, tells a thousand stories, but also with um, drillable visualizations, what you can actually do is you can ask more questions. Question, you know, big, big data or data solutions, data analytics solutions, business intelligence solutions are always about the questions. But like we don't know the questions when it comes to medical issues. But uh, this is one that uh, some of the CCGs here in England came up with and sort of said, well, um, we know a lot of asthma patients end up in hospital because they misuse their medicines some, some, somehow or other. If we can get uh, those patients in, do a medical use review with them, um, look at adjusting their meds or how they use their meds, we're going to have great outcomes. So they came up with a question and the question was, I don't know if it's come off the page here, Stephen, is it? Thanks, Bill. It's going up. Yeah, so, um, again, I'm not a medical professional, uh, but what, I do actually suffer a bit from asthma, so I do know a little bit about this. So there's two different types of inhalers. There, there's the bronchodilators, which are the uh, relievers, so you're feeling wheezy, you're about to have a fit, you take a shot of the, uh, the blue one, as I would call it. Um, but, you know, my doctor would describe me as well, the corticosteroids. So these are the preventers as such. So we should be taking, generally taking a mixture of these maybe not for all conditions, but generally there should be a mixture of them. And if we measure across all of the uh, prescribing that's done in England, we find that there's 31 million to 21, 20 million of, of a mixture of these. Uh, I just maybe describe where the data comes from. Uh, the NHS published the, the prescribing data and the dispensing data. This is based on the prescribing data, which is actually much more detailed than, than the dispensing data. So for every single practice, in England, we know exactly what, what they're, they're, they're prescribing. And across the whole of the country, that's the, the kind of mixture. So then we say, well, okay, let's color you know, across England where the, the ratios are poor, where there's less of the, uh, the preventers than there are of the relievers. And you, you probably see things you kind of expect to see a little bit, which is in the more disadvantaged areas in the, on the northeast and some of the midlands, you know, they're kind of black spots. There's, there's less of this going on. I couldn't tell you why that is. You know, it seemed to me that. A, a GP practice should be as well educated and do the right kind of prescribing as they do it elsewhere. I, I don't know what the, 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 the real insight is around this. All, all I do is I get the question and then we drill into it a little bit more. But one of the interesting ones, you know, we're sitting in London here today, it might surprise you to see that there are some black spots in London. So I, I'd like, I'm going to go in and have a little bit of a drill in on that, a little bit more of a look at that. Uh, so I'll just click on this one here. 
I said, this is live, um, you know, going to our server, uh, analyzing the data. Uh, maybe refresh the URL. Okay. Yeah, just, just. Uh, refresh yourself. Uh, we opened this a while ago, so yeah, probably. Yeah, it's done. So it don't work with live demos. <laughs> now we know it's real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've clicked into London. So we we focus in the London area. You can see there's some very good areas, you know, where we we don't seem to have a problem there as such. You know, so the, the next question might be, well, let's go a little bit deeper and, and look, look at the problem areas. And in the line system, for anybody that works with data, you probably will recognize, you know, this, this visualization. This is from Tableau. Tableau is the visualization engine that we use. And I can just sort of focus in on all of these guys here. And it will bring up for me then the actual list of all the surgeries in there. So the data is... is uh, you know, Johnny would have said, you know, we need, we need insights, but for it to be real and for us to be able to do jobs with this, we need to do the drillings and actually see, you know, where, where are the problems, because we want to ultimately go and, and, and work with those problems. So again, you know, you can see the clusters in there, but specifically when I'm solving the problem, which if, it, if it's an education um, issue with a, with a particular doctor, or um, it's maybe trying to, you know, connect to the pharmacies kind of around there, you know, I could just pick one of these, these surgeries, I don't know that surgery at all, and I can look at their numbers, um, and I can go and talk to that surgeon. Actually, for our, for our pharmacy customers, what we actually do for them is, we know from the data, because we link the, um, the script direction with that actual surgery, so we know that the pharmacies are actually affected by this. Um, so when you come to the question of, like, to engage the patient, you've got to get right down to that lowest level, if you like. So we've got the, the insight here of where the problems might be across the country, the regions we want to maybe you know, focus in on. Um, it can be by CCG where some of this stuff is actually done. Um, but ultimately, you know, we need to get to the patient. And so pharmacy that has the patient record and the patient names and so on, we don't see it here, but we now can sort of say, you know, the main pharmacy or pharmacies that uh, those scripts go to, we can have a, a deep dive into that, and within their PMR, they can actually see which of these patients are getting um, uh, not enough of, of the actual um, uh, uh, um, the, the corticosteroids. Um, but actually, um, the pharmacies, as it happens here in certain areas of CCG, the, the CCGs are actually paying them to do free to do tests and pay them to do those tests. And their criteria is if they've had six of the bronchodilators without any of the corticosteroids, they qualify for a free test. Um, now I'm going into this example at the moment now to maybe stimulate some of your thoughts of maybe how you might think about using this in your businesses uh, to get the outcomes that you're looking for. You know, if I was working with a particular condition, you know, there's going to be other questions that you could come up with. This is just the asthma example. There are other ones. We're not professionals, but we do have access to this data, and, and lots of other people do. The NHS data is easy enough to get. Uh, but then, if you want to do the, the sort of the, the go the last mile, as we used to call it, the telco space, uh, you need to be able to get the patient. And the GPs and the pharmacies are the ones with the patients. And we might argue, knowing a little bit more about the GP <coughs> pharmacies, even though they're busy people, they're not maybe quite as busy as the as the as the, as the doctors are. And um, their model is getting disrupted now, and they are open to looking at some things that they haven't been doing, you know, heretofore. Have you ever made, um, so you started off with a hypothesis that <coughs> areas that will use less corticosteroids are potentially going to get more people going into hospital. So have you seen that in that map to actually say that in the green areas where they're doing this well and using more corticosteroids we actually get less admissions? Yeah, we don't, we don't have that data, but that would be a really, really interesting yeah. uh, thing to do, all right. We do, <coughs> we do the same uh, drillable around uh, the, just the medicines part of what Stephen's going to show around diabetes. Um, it, it was really interesting. Like in London, London had the same sort of picture. <coughs> it had that those red areas, but there was a big green spot right in the middle. Uh, and showing that to somebody, I said, "What the heck is this? Like, you know, is this really a particularly well-to-do area in London?" They looked at it. And said, no, it wasn't at all. Uh, but if somebody knew what was going on, there was a diabetes clinic working in that area on a specific kind of pilot project, and it obviously was working. They were, they were identifying more patients um, early on that had diabetes, so therefore we weren't getting the same kind of ratio there. 
but so it's always about connecting up the, the data to get the real picture, and we just got to send that bit, a bit of here. No, this was back up in case the internet didn't work. <laughs> So I'm going to hand over to Stephen now, but um, you might be wondering, uh, sitting there wondering why a company based in Dublin is doing all this work you know, for um, pharmacies here based in England, we're working here about three years or so, and uh, really as Dublin has become a little bit of a, a data analytics kind of hub as based around you know, Ireland's success in you know, bringing in the Facebooks, the LinkedIn's, the Airbnb's, the Qualtrics of this world, and the colleges are just churning uh, graduates out into, into the workplace. And in 2017, we sort of well, let's see how we kind of sit against these guys. And we entered the, the, the Data Science Awards, of which all these big guys were in. And we just entered three, um, three of the categories. And we just got shortlisted in all of them. We didn't win any of them. They're all won by, one was won by IBM, another one was won by another multi-billion kind of company. But this one here um, was one that Stephen worked on. Uh, so Stephen presented at that particular conference. Uh, Stephen. Um, is they're going to talk about the machine learning kind of more advanced kind of you know data analytics stuff uh, in a second. Uh, some of you may be wondering about the similarity or indeed the exact uh, nature of our, our, our surnames, what the relationship is. Uh, Stephen is actually my son, uh, but in case you jump to the nepotism um, uh, <laughs> conclusion, uh, Stephen is a, is a graduate of Trinity College, a uh, science graduate of Trinity College. He went, in, went on and did his master's in, in data analytics. Um, his paper actually got published. It's actually that is what he's going to present here to you today. Thank you. I was going to thank my mom's second name for this presentation. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, my project that I did was predicting uh, diabetes. Um, so, like, what is diabetes, first of all? So, it's when the uh, body becomes insulin resistant. So, insulin is basically a hormone to kind of send signal to the body to absorb glucose into the bloodstream. Um, so when that signal is not there, this can lead to major health complications. And there's currently 240 people, uh, million people living worldwide with diabetes. And then and the World Health Organization estimates this is going to be one of the major uh, leading causes of death by 2030. So there's like already like lots of well-known uh, risk indicators for diabetes, lots of studies around these things, so like age, weight, uh, blood pressure and, and stuff like that, and uh, lots of the kind of advances in machine learning have allowed really successful models to be able to build using diabetes. So you might say, why was I trying to tackle this problem? Well, a lot of the, these studies are using uh, clinical healthcare data sets. So that's like when you or I go into the hospital, they measure your blood pressure, they get you on a weighing scales, do your BMI, do your um, cholesterol, uh, and capture all that information. But obviously this is really expensive to capture because it requires the patient to go into the hospital, it requires doctors to do the analysis, it requires uh, lab work, and then as well like the sample sizes are obviously a lot smaller because it takes a lot of time to do this. And um, if the patient's already going into the hospital, there's probably a fair chance that they already know they're at risk or there's already a potential problem there. Um, so in my study I kind of proposed, well let, let's actually look at the uh, patient medical record systems in pharmacies. So there's a huge volume of data that's already being captured there. So it's readily available. Um, it's also passively captured. So whenever you go in to get a prescription, they've got all your details on their system. You put in your prescription, they give it out to you. So the information is just sitting there in the background. No hospital visits are required. Um, and obviously everybody goes to their pharmacy, not everyone goes into the hospital. So you've got a potential much bigger audience of people that you could impact with the predictive model using this PMR uh, data. And so not only this, you could potentially reduce the cost of the testing by running like a model on PMR data and potentially also get some earlier diagnosis. Um, because if you're not you know, seeing the risk factors yourself and going to the hospital, we might be able to capture it with all that dispensing information. So kind of before jumping into it, I know we've sort of got a bit of a mixed audience. A lot of you kind of maybe already know this, but I think it's interesting to, to mention anyway. So what is machine learning? So off the internet there, machine learning is a field of artificial intelligence. They use statistical techniques to give computer systems the ability to learn from data without being explicitly programmed. So uh, let's do a little fun example first of all. You know, I think it's always best to show something simple to start with. So this is kind of a bit silly, but I, I made it up. And um, so here we've got like a list of dog breeds. So we've got greyhounds and bulldogs. 
Then we've got you know, a couple of features or some information about them. So we've got their weight and then we've got their height. So what happens if we get a new record into our system? And we don't know if it's a greyhound, we don't know if it's a bulldog, but we do have the information and the different features. So what we can do is we can actually train a model using like the, the weight and height to be able to classify based on our, our labeled training data sets. So if you, you look at that there, me and you can probably quickly tell, we can have a fair guess maybe of, of what the, this dog might be, the new one. But uh, this is just one particular um, machine learning uh, technique, so it's called K-nearest neighbors. But basically you can see we were pl plotting all the data points there, so we've got, say, whatever it is, um, weight along the bottom, right across the top, and we're plotting up the greyhounds here, the bulldogs here. We get our new data points, and then we look at the nearest neighbors uh, to this new data point, and we can see, okay, here, if these are two bulldogs, we can then classify that as a bulldog. So that's kind of a, a simple example, and now I'm going to talk about my example that I tackled, which was the, the diabetes problem. Um, so the first thing I kind of had to do was uh, gather the data. So we work with over like a thousand pharmacies across um, uh, Ireland and the UK, but I just did this little pilot scheme with 43 pharmacies, so that was split across two different groups. Um, so the first thing I did was like take patient records and anonymize all the data, so leaving behind all the patient information. I didn't need it to, to train the model. Um, and then I kind of split the data into my training data set. So I looked at the patients who were diabetic, and then the patients that were not diabetic, and I, I labeled them correctly. Then the next thing was, I was looking at all the different medications that these patients were being dispensed. So, kind of one of the main problems here is that there's like over 50,000 different medications that any given patient uh, can be dispensed. So, it's difficult to make sense of this information and actually plug it into a model to churn out some results. Because like when you've got over 50,000 medicines, like the complexity just becomes huge and then you run into like, um, you know, problems there. So what I did was I used the BNF category, so that's the British National Formula. So what they do is they categorize all the different medications into the correct conditions. And so uh, one of the challenges here was that not all the names were exactly the same, so I had to use a technique called fuzzy matching to match up the medicine names with the different conditions. And so after doing that, I got about a 95% match for all the different medications that could be dispensed. So from this, I derived all the conditions that a patient might be uh, suffering from. So in total, I had like 80 different features for any given, given patient. So I had you know, the obvious ones like age, sex, and then I had the medical conditions. So here's just kind of like an example of one of the records which I had for training my model. So I had yeah, age, gender, and then I had you know, all the different conditions. So I had over 80 conditions, and then whether or not the patient suffered from that condition. So I had like you know, zero, zero if they didn't, one if they did and then I have whether or not they are diabetic or non-diabetic. So now I have my data to train the model to see what are the combinations of these different conditions and features to output a diabetic or non-diabetic um, classification. Uh, so I had over 80 features, like that's quite a lot. So what I wanted to do was actually select what the most important features were for predicting diabetes. So there's kind of a couple of reasons why you might do this. So one is you want to better understand the contributing factors of diabetes. So we want to potentially like learn something new. So we want to cut out any of the conditions that might have nothing to do with diabetes or might not help us predict it at all and show just what the really important ones are to maybe uncover some new information. The other thing as well is to decrease the training time. So this is to decrease the complexity. So these machine learning models, they can take like a long time to train. So you want to optimize and make this process as efficient as possible. So by cutting out loads of features, it makes it easier to train. Another thing is uh, overfitting, so when you're running these models you can overfit uh, for your particular data set. So if I was taking in every feature, it might only work on that data set, but I want to be able to apply this model in you know, different regions, different areas, and different, um, yeah, different cohorts of patients. And then also to remove the noise, I kind of already touched on that already, so non-important features. So I used two machine learning models to um, predict for diabetes and I wanted to kind of benchmark them against each other. So like when I was sort of doing my study and my background research into like what models I was going to use, um, I kind of noticed in, in the field that random forests were used quite a lot and then neural networks as well. So they're the two models that I decided to evaluate. So a random forest is basically just a collection of like decision trees. So you're probably already familiar with what a decision tree might look like. So here's kind of just an example of what it might look like for predicting diabetes. So 
Are they over 60? Yes or no? If yes, it goes this way. Do they have high cholesterol, high blood pressure? If it's yes, we're going to output this diabetic you know, prediction. So that's kind of like a simple idea of what one of the trees might look like. Obviously, I had like a lot more conditions in there, but that's just what it could look like. Uh, the, other thing, the other model I used was the neural network. So the neural, the neural network is based, basically based around like the biological neural network, so like your brain. And so you can kind of think about like your eyes are like the input layer, so that's like where the data is fed into the network. So you know when we're looking, you look at things in the world, we're, we're taking in the information like the light, all that stuff goes into our brain, and then we're computing what the images are. That's kind of what's happening in the brain. So this is kind of what's happening in the network. So we have like this input layer, and then it's passed on to our hidden layer here, uh, which is connected by these weighted connections. Uh, and then outputting a diabetes classification. So my classification model was a binary classification, so you know, a yes or no, are they diabetic or non-diabetic. So then evaluating the results. So having done the feature selection, I had over 80 different features, I was able to reduce it down to these ones here. So the presence or lack of presence of these different features was what was going to help me classify whether someone was diabetic or non-diabetic. So we're kind of already seeing some of the things there that we already know about diabetes, like age is a big risk factor that's known, uh, gender, I think males are, are more likely to get diabetes, and then you've got the different medications here, so you've got like high blood pressure medications, cholesterol medications, and then some diet related medications there too. So the learnings there are kind of already what's known about diabetes, and but having kind of done a bit of a deeper dive on the research, uh, specifically uh, laxatives and these rectal disorders, that's not something I came across too much in the literature. There were some kind of correlations between diabetes and these things, but it kind of just goes to show maybe there's more area for research into what's the relationship between diabetes and, and the risk of diabetes and then these kind of conditions. Were you able to incorporate any dietary elements as well into this? So obviously the pharmacy and the people Yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't actually get the chance to do that. So that would be definitely a really interesting route to go down. So you could look at like some of the OTC sales as well with that. Um, but one of the kind of issues around that, so we uh, process this front of shop information and the dispensing information as well, is that you don't always have the link to the patient in the front of shop sales. So if you're able to kind of overcome that challenge, I think that actually would really be an interesting insight to kind of pull into it. And um, I want time to purchase. Yeah, yeah, you could you could do something around that. Yeah, you could link up. Yeah, on the time because yeah, you'd have the the the, the, the dispensing date and the date of sale, so they would be the same, if not a, f a few seconds across. Stephen did this with a data set from from two Irish groups, and a, Irish pharmacies don't have patient care records like you do here. Um, not sure whether we could have used them here anyway, but you know if you could add a dash yeah, as an as an input, that obviously would would tune the model even further. Yeah, when I was presenting this back to the guys I did the study with, they were like one of, they they mentioned one another interesting thing to pull in would actually be like uh, geolocation information. So if you could see like where the patients were living, were there kind of trends in different like socioeconomic areas on on diabetes. So I think that would be another step forward to go with it as well. And um, what time period did you look at? Uh, so I looked over I think it was four years. So dispensing of four years, yeah. Um, so yeah, just having a look at the evaluation of the results. So once I had trained my model on my uh, training data set, then kind of what we do is do a test against the test data set. So we run the model against these records that we know, and we say, okay, I put your classification, are they diabetic or non-diabetic? And then we compare it against the actual classification, if you're diabetic or not. So the random forest was able to achieve a 77% uh, accuracy. And then there's just some of the other like precision metrics. So you've got like true positive rate, false positive rate. So th these are all capturing how many times did it say someone was you know diabetic when they weren't, or when when they weren't diabetic that they were, kind of thing. Could uh, you cross reference yeah. the results of all the conditions with other possible conditions that can cause similar comorbidities to sort of eliminate non-diabetics? So well, I'm not quite sure. Well, so like if, if yeah. you had um, sort of the difference between like type one and type two, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. diabetes as well as like other conditions like sort of like someone's just overweight, yeah, but not diabetic, but then they've got other conditions that sort of simulate diabetes or at least the conditions that could. Yeah, no, no, I didn't actually look into that, but like that would be really interesting. And pulling in that BMI information 
would be yeah, really helpful as well because that is one of the greatest predictors of, of diabetes. Over the four years as well, I guess some of those patients would have yeah. been diagnosed to be diabetic at some point and then got on to diabetes medicine. So did the model go back and see if those risk factors that they're predicting are saying that a person's diabetic actually showed it in the model as well, that they actually became diabetic? Well, so to simplify, like my model when I was building it, I actually stripped out all the, 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 the time element of it. So I was just looking at like the aggregated information of all the medicines that they'd have been dispensed. But to do that like trend analysis actually will be like a very yeah, interesting area to go to. So they're all being your diabetic group right now. Yeah, there'd yeah. be some that would be changed. Diabetic. Exactly. Yeah, no, that would be really cool. And then you could also like look at the trend, look at the change and, and, and figure out what kind yeah. of part of the journey of diabetes are they on. Yeah. Um, that would definitely be a really interesting step to, to kind of take it further. Questions always get, you get questions in, in, in this sort of area, but maybe to give the context, if this project kind of started off with a much more simplified you know, model than this in our company, when one of our customers in, in Ireland turned around to us and said, um, I'd like to introduce a diabetes testing service, which I'm going to pay for myself to see if I can recruit some patients uh, from, from, from my, my pharmacy and around my pharmacies. So rather than just having a blanket in invite or men over 55, which we know are higher risk, you know, he wanted to be more razor-like in his invitations, much more cost-effective way of doing it. So that's kind of, I suppose, the context where this is. But of course, you can take this and you can iterate and iterate. Uh, then on the neural network, so similar performance, a little bit worse. Um, but see, the volume of data that I probably had to train it wasn't enough to really like improve this. So the more records you're able to kind of introduce, the more and more you can improve this and, and, and it reiterate and achieve like better accuracies. So then I kind of did an evaluation. Okay, so like how does this stack up against those sort of uh, those um, models that I mentioned at the start? So all the other ones are using that clinical data set, so that really detailed data, but that's very difficult and expensive to capture. So you can see like there is a fair gap there, but using the PMR data, it's much more available, and you also have potential impact a higher range of people. So you know you might forfeit some of that accuracy, you know, for to have a higher impact. Um, and then just to kind of jump into the sort of main conclusions, so, so a couple of the main missing features that I had, you know, when I compared against like the best in class methods using that clinical data was the family history. So we were kind of having actually a discussion about this the other day and it might be possible to derive this from the PMR data, you know, based on, you know, second names or based on addresses or in Ireland we have a scheme, I think it's the family GMS card. So you're basically issued out a card for your family and you have like the same number. So you might be able to add in the feature there, say, is there diabetes in the family or not? So that would be another interesting area to go a bit further. And then BMI, that's one of the biggest risk indicators for diabetes, so obviously, like we didn't have that information. But you could potentially pull in that, you know, if you're inviting people in to give them a diabetes screening, this is something that maybe you'd be able to measure or take it in from external data sets. Um, so this potentially could be used as like a preliminary diagnosis tool. This probably isn't the right word here. I'd say more an at-risk tool. So we can actually identify people who are at risk, and as Connell mentioned there, you know, you could potentially be inviting these guys in and say, hey, we're doing a diabetes information evening, you know, we think like might, might be useful to come, and uh, they can do a proper diabetes like insulin uh, uh, or uh, blood pressure test then. And so another thing that this model could be used for is like continuous testing over time. So obviously, we kind of talked about the journey of a patient. Uh, you know, you could constantly be reiterating, reiterating and retesting them as they're dispensed uh, new medicines and they're kind of, you know, getting new conditions. This could also reduce the cost of uh, diagnosis, so I kind of mentioned that earlier on as well, and then lead to that earlier diagnosis. So diabetes is something that you really want to be able to manage quickly, and the more, uh, more quickly you're able to get around to manage it, the better your kind of long-term outcomes are going to be. This could also improve the kind of pharmacy-patient relationship. So if the pharmacists are seen as being proactive towards their patients, that's going to increase the loyalty with their patients and improve the relationships there. Um, and then it's going to allow them to offer those additional services. So I know over here in the UK, the pharmacies are being cut massively uh, um, by the NHS. So maybe there's more room here to do more services and get paid around doing these around uh, diabetes. And from the business point of view, diabetes patients are regular patients. They're coming in all the time. Um, and you know, this is just done with diabetes for this particular study. But this same concept, the same model using that PMR data could be done 
use with a number of different conditions. Yeah, go for it, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's something that's been going through my mind while you've been talking about yeah. how it would apply to particularly conditions where there's a smaller population. Mm -hmm. So you've got less features, you've got uh, probably more outliers, or it's harder, harder to, to really sort of identify what the, the key features are to focus on. I, do you think machine learning is really appropriate for, for kind of those small sample sizes, or do you think it only really works for, for a large mass market? Kind of? Yeah, so I think it's really useful when you have like really large data sets. Um, because to be able to identify those patterns, you need lots and lots and lots of data to be able to, because you have those outlier cases that you mentioned, so you want to be able to kind of just reduce the noise and, and reduce the effect that they're having on your prediction model. I mean, you can always test these things and like look at the accuracy, look at the performance metrics and see if they're viable and worthwhile doing. Yeah. Um, and you know, the thing with healthcare as well is like, if you have, so one of the things that you have to kind of set when you're doing these prediction models is your decision threshold. So when you're doing the neural network and the random forest, you're not, you are outputting a prediction of are they diabetic or non-diabetic, but kind of under the hood, you're actually outputting like a probability where they fall in between that diabetes and non-diabetes. So for my study, I kind of arbitrarily chose the, the middle point. If it's over 50% likely, you know, you're, you're putting them into the diabetic or non-diabetic, and, and that's how the model works. Uh, so you know when you have those cases there that you mentioned, which are smaller data sets, you know, if you reduce the decision threshold to have more false positives, that's not a bad thing in healthcare. So when you have someone who's false positive, you know, that they have diabetes, you can invite them in and test them and see if they have it or not. Um, but if you miss people, you have those false negatives, that's a problem. Um, so, you know, there still might be value in doing it on, on smaller sample size, but it's not going to be as accurate or as effective as these big data sets. You can certainly use the big data set to do the, you know, you're looking for a needle in a haystack, mm -hmm. basically among 12 patients in, 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 in the particular region you're looking for. If you've got a really good question, you know, you've got a well-defined, you know, what the conditions or the medicines that they're likely to be on, if they have your condition, that, that's, that's very good. We can use the data if we get the patient data either from the, the, the practices or from the pharmacies, you know, we can use it to, to find them, um, whether machine learning is going to identify that even better don't know to you really experiment. Yeah. So, so now you've done this piece of work and, and kind of tested the hypothesis yes. and got this algorithm. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the algorithm being used? Do you sell it to a pharmacy and they interrogate their system to identify who to test and yeah. call in? Or do you see it as pharma using it to help them yeah. on a mass scale? Or how do you see it? Good question. I'll show you right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so I did the study. I had this this algorithm or whatever, that's brilliant, but like how are you going to actually practically apply it? So I built like a little, just a little like front end where, you know, pharmacies could maybe have access to something like this. This is all theoretical at the moment, it's not actually out in the, the real world yet, but I do have the two pharmacies I work with, they are going to take this on as a test case and see actually, you know, how effective it is. And um, so first of all, I'll show you like maybe some of the, the, the raw PMR records that a pharmacy would have access to. So these are fairly standard. And don't, don't be worried that you're seeing patient names or I just made them up. So <laughs> it's not actually real data. Oh, James McGill. That's, that's, so that's, just, that's just his records. And then I have all the, you know, the, whatever, the next patient's records under here. But yeah, you can see there. So I've got like whatever the name of the patient, who they are. So I've got those features I was talking about. Then I've got all the different trade names. So they're all the different medications I, I kind of spoke about. And so these are the ones that I was mapping back into the BNF category. So for each one of these, I'm putting it into what condition it treats and then whatever their expense. So a pharmacy might have a record like this that they can export from their PMR system. And then uh, using this, uh, yeah, so use my model, I can go, okay, let's do like an upload the file here. So I can upload the file, the raw data, that's the patient data, load it in. And then it outputs my prediction. So you saw all those different names in there, so it's saying, this probably should be at risk of diabetic or non-diabetic. So then the pharmacy could use this to filter out all these people and then to do those like direct targeted invites to those people say, hey, do you want to come in and have a proper diabetes test? So this is still dependent on someone loading something into something else? Um, it, it, it is at the moment now, but like, that would be probably fairly simple to automate that process of you know, exporting the, the data and just yeah. loading it in. And you could constantly be running this every single night or in real time 
and then spinning so is that out. Saying that's this current basis based on the other, or is that based on? So if they are yeah. diabetic, it would say that they were. So if they had diabetic treatment, it would say they died. This actually should say like the model has predicted that this person might be at risk of diabetes. So that's kind of what that's doing. They, they none of these people <coughs> here are diagnosed as being diabetic. And then these people here are saying, you know, from what the model's learned, this person doesn't look like they've got diabetes. So these are the kind of people that you want to focus on as potentially at risk. I guess what I'm saying is if you've got all that data, yeah. the model wouldn't go, actually, this person hasn't got diabetes, even though they have. Do you see what I'm saying? So if you had a money record, they're actually technically they have diabetes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they would, be, they would probably be filtered out. The model wouldn't say, actually, this may not be Yeah, yeah, if they, I would, so, you'd feel the right. ethical elements in here, I guess, is what Yeah, yeah, no, no, sure, yeah, no, I see, see what you're saying, yeah. So this is kind of really like a decision support tool, it's not like a diagnosis tool, it's just to help the pharmacy make kind of better decisions on strategy of how they're going to, you know, target these people, you know. So, so Sandy, that, that was a technical question, technical answer to your, to your question, so the, the commercial answer is, uh, we don't know, and we, our core business is helping pharmacy groups make better business decisions around our data as such. I suppose if we had a hidden agenda today, it was to highlight the potential value of pharmacy data and how it's really untapped as such. Um, Stephen, we, we could go to these pharmacy groups and talk to them about you know, doing something like this, but they have no motivation to do it. They're, 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 they're really busy people, particularly here in the UK, more so than Ireland, and they make their money in other areas. Uh, generally, you can only lead pharmacists here anywhere, actually, you know, by financial notes, mm -hmm. uh, so they, they would have to be paid. Yeah. Uh, you know, they'd have to be paid probably for their data, they'd have to be probably paid if they were going to do services around this. But I think the overriding thing that we'd like to leave you think, thinking about is that we're now potentially able to identify huge numbers of potential people that could be affected by lots of different conditions. And if we can tap into this, 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 this data source and somehow bring the pharmacy groups, or it could be doctors as well, you know, do the same job. There's lots you can do with it. It's not, not just identifying patients, but even ones that are not complying or not using the mm -hmm. oh, yeah. so big, big time. Like we we yeah. talked about, talk about this offline with you, but we did get kind of drawn into a project in Ireland by a group of pharmacists that uh, were unhappy about giving their data away, you know, nearly free and seeing, you know, other people making loads of money from it. They learned a very harsh lesson that actually uh, informed this company to do this. We were taking the data from foreign pharmacies, uh, but they didn't know how to sell it. They, they couldn't sell it. They didn't have the connections to sell it. We learned a huge insight from that as well too. Real World Analytics will never sell this either. Uh, we are just maybe part of the puzzle because we've got the relationships with the pharmacy groups and with the PMR providers to get the data. And whilst there are other people pulling data from pharmacy groups, only pulling the subset. And the challenge isn't pulling the subset, I think Stephen touched on it, is cleansing the data um, and, and making sure that it's, 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 it's right. Yeah. yeah. So considering that you learn trade names and all that, so theoretically you could sell it back to the pharmacy to say that, you know, these patients are diabetic and they're getting probably one of the most expensive medicines. Mm. If you change to this medicine, then you can make more money against whichever tariff you're clawing your money back as pharmacists do. Yeah. You, you don't find two, two, two pharmacists in the room. <laughs> we were totally the pharmacist. Um, they're not as commercial as, as, as um, you know some business areas, if you like. Um, they, they need to be kind of led, and they, they particularly here in, in the UK, the NHS is their paymaster, and the, and the NHS um, lead them, if you like, in what they do. So if they say we're going to pay you for a particular service, mm -hmm. you know, they actually even struggle sometimes to do those services. Um, so to to bring something to them, which is a great business development idea of one of a better term. We do what one of our guys in Ireland did do this and got a great outcome from it. Um, it it's, it's not trivial. It, it, it would be a challenge. I think if I was an owner of a pharmacy group, you know, I'd be looking at trying to do this because this would differentiate me from the other guys. I think it could help you to understand which services you could provide because there's lots of need in the world. Yeah. But the pharm pharmacy groups here, because the, the public data is so good, you, you could actually have, like the example of Welders Group, you know, they're fairly tightly kind of um, up there in North Yorkshire, but you could find one in New Yorkshire or near a particular area, you know, certain conditions prevail there, but they're different over here as such, so you could actually fine tune your services to the patients that are coming into your pharmacy. Is there a particular thought process that you go through almost in the pre-analysis stage, almost in the sort of 
understanding of the question and then starting to understand the area around it a bit more that helps you then go into the more yeah. kind of operational bits of, okay, I'm going to need a model, I'm going to need these pieces of data. Is, is yeah, so like uh, when I was looking through, like I'm not a pharmacist or I don't have any medical background, so the first kind of step that I did was like, okay, let's, what are the known risk factors already about diabetes? So like I went and I looked at the other studies, I looked to kind of capture what all those bits of pieces are, and then I looked at the data that was available to me. So I went on and I looked at you know all these PMR records, PMR records and, and the medicines, and then I was like, how can I actually like derive some of these features from what I have available to me? And then kind of you know came okay, came across the DNF categories. I was like, okay, maybe I can actually like get the conditions from here. So like yeah, it was that whole part is what actually takes the longest like. I was going to ask next. Yeah. What's the sort of split of time? No, yeah, there's the big like the big joke in data science is like eighty percent eighty percent of data science is cleaning the data, twenty percent is data science. Like so, it's all that prepping that actually takes like the longest time. Like um, there's so many like you know machine learning frameworks like Google have their TensorFlow or whatever. Like if you've got access to a computer, you can download Python or or programming, and like it's very easy to run these models. Like the data science community is extremely open source. So everyone shares their code, everyone shares their models. The problem is actually just getting the data to load into those models. And then of course you do need a bit of the expertise to analyze the results and to kind of make sense of them. But running them is fairly uh, straightforward. It's just that first initial uh, step of understanding what the problem actually is, how you're going to get the data, and yeah, then, ch and then choosing your model. Experts in, in the conditions, case, or conditions would, would definitely you know, fine tune, it would they accelerate this, this was done. Yeah, we got some of the questions from, from our pharmacy uh, guys because they know medicines better than anybody. Um, so, yeah, you know, that definitely would, would, would help if we were looking to develop this for, in some kind of direction. I think that's a good point. It's so accessible. That's probably why all these projects are not profitable mm -hmm. because you have people who can fire data at something without being experts or without having cleansed it. They've spent all this money analyzing, but they haven't really done background work prepared to them. But uh, interesting, uh, when I saw, saw what you were showing, I was thinking about measuring success. The success of this model is, the, the way you measure the success of your model is different to how you would predict, measure the success of it being rolled out. Because in the model, you'd kind of want to predict, could we predict uh, diabetes? Whereas if you rolled out, you actually actioned that data. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the success would be that we'd have, it would be a different way to measure success. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you'd have less people yeah. actually uh, being treated for diabetes effecti effectively because they've avoided it. Mm. You know, so you have to understand how you measure success over time. Yeah, yeah, we'd have, we'd have to be going back to that original question. You know, if we just stop a certain percentage ending up in hospital A and E, you know, presenting there at the high cost there, we can kind of connect that back. Yeah, that, that's 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 the thing. That's the circle squared. If we need the data, and we need the time and the incentive to do it, I suppose. How long did it take you to? to do this kind of project in uh, Yeah, so like I did it uh, over like six or seven months, but that was working, like I was working full-time job, but this was kind of like a side, like for college, so I was doing this like part-time like in my evenings and, and weekends. And like a lot, a lot of the time spent, yeah, on that research, doing the review <coughs> of the existing literature, and then assessing like the different models. And like I was obviously fortunate enough that I was able to do an illustrating project, so I had access to the data, so like that wasn't an issue for me. But um, like a lot of my kind of peers or whatever, their biggest challenge was actually getting access to the data or finding high quality, you know, public data sets. Cool, so I think I'll pass on to Colin May to give a little summary. I think it was the operative word. I was thinking we're nearly, nearly on our time here. And so yeah, no, uh, just talk about the imperatives for, you know, for, for, uh, for pharma and healthcare funders in terms of you know, um, whether it's an opportunity to use this data or it's an imperative to use this, this data to push forward. And in one of my, my research, uh, I found this paper, uh, which is you know, publicly available from McKinsey, and they kind of go through all the kind of issues. Sandy, you were talking about your, your, your team, data analytics, analytics people, and kind of pull them all together. And uh, according to McKinsey, they sort of say, well, you know, this, this is the way to pull the data analytics together. You know, if we can use it to, to do the ability to deliver more personalized patient care, you know, that's one of the big wins. If we can use it to engage more fully with um, physicians and patients, that's a big win.